Hello YouTube, how are we all today? Today I am interviewing our DM at Paris. So let's get into it. First of all, Paris, how are you today? I'm not bad, thank you. Slightly nervous, but other than that, I'm all right. What about yourself? I'm good. I'm not the one under the spotlight. <laughs> so um, we'll jump straight into it. Uh, first thing, how did you get into Pathfinder? Oh, see, originally I, I, I wasn't playing Pathfinder. Um, I was originally playing Dungeons and Dragons, as, as people often start out doing. Um, over a decade ago, about 15, 17 years ago now, um, I was at school, or secondary school, and someone invited me to join their Dungeons and Dragons group. I'd not heard of it before. The hobby wasn't as, as popular back then. Um, I was intrigued. It was very much in line with some of my hobbies. I, I, I grew up playing things like Warhammer, um, playing video games with role-playing elements, things like Final Fantasy, et cetera. Um, yeah. So I, I was really interested went to it enjoyed it um and after that first session um eventually it ended up going to to pathfinder uh, when it was published under the open games license and yeah played that ever since that's uh i didn't know it was 17 years ago that, that is some time ago there paris <laughs> um so did you instantly fall in love with the game then I certainly enjoyed the first session. I mean, we're a bunch of secondary schoolers um, playing Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. Um, I, I played as a player and I really enjoyed it. Um, but, you know, first groups, I, I found that my first group faded out very quickly. Um, it wasn't until a couple of years later that we resurrected it, um, got all the books um, and started playing it. Um, I, I played as a as the dungeon master there and one of the things that we did do was a uh, I, I ran was a, a one-off campaign which was a, a haunted house i'd I end up downloading the map for a for an old manor house throwing in just random monsters from the monster manual um but that's what made it fun it wasn't scaled at all some of the monsters would take out the player in one hit um but it added to the suspense and since then i've i've been a dungeon master every ever since um when i started playing pathfinder um, I played with a small group and then that died down as again groups often do but when I met my my now wife um, she was interested and what we did was we took turns I was the I was the game master or dungeon master and she was the player and and we sort of took turns doing that until our current group yeah the current group I mean one thing you said there was the you know the monster killing everyone and the um, the downloaded graphics it kind of reminds me of season one where uh, not everything was smooth, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> certainly not um, my background or anything that I've made, that's for sure. But it was fun. Uh, anyone that watches season one, just skip to season three. Anyway, <laughs> how long does it take to create an episode? Well, it depends. I mean, when I originally started being a, a dungeon master and... and playing from that perspective is it was putting together a scenario it was putting together the uh, what monsters i was going to use and it took a little bit more time me being inexperienced one of the things that i think a lot of new dungeon masters get caught up on or at least i did when i started and you know i've well, you know done a little bit of work with other people on, on their journey to becoming a dungeon master is a lot of people get worried about getting the rules wrong or um you know, not doing things in the proper way where I don't think there is a set or proper way of doing things. I know obviously we have the rule books to to go by, but um, you know, they always say the first rule is to to have fun and facilitate that game. So um yeah, I, I would say when I first started, we weren't using all the accoutrements or the additional things. So for example, it was just us some character sheets and some dice. So there was no map map making i had to worry about no tokens no anything like that um to build a game we've obviously got a much more i wouldn't say sophisticated but a, a complex game from from an it perspective i'd never used miniatures before so the idea of setting up and building a map that does take a, a reasonable amount of time i would say maps could take a couple of hours to put together so that would just be one scene a, a piece of scenery that we'd use um 
I would say I, I probably spend about an hour every now and then working on scenarios. It's very easy to just pick monsters and chuck them at your party. Um, the hardest thing I always find is developing scenarios that I think that will either draw the party in or that they'll find intriguing. And sometimes you guys go in a completely different direction and sometimes I have to wing it. That was... Oh, well, that leads into my next question. What do you do when Giles decides to go off the radar and off the books and does something completely crazy or Angelus decides to burn down a house? And, you know, where do those... Or how do you so quickly come up with what you're going to do? I think experience. I think also not being surprised or shocked that you guys go a bit off. Not that there's a script, but I think one of the, the worst things... I feel like I could do as a DM would be to keep you on a on a railway road track that you guys can't leave. I think I have to not necessarily anticipate everything that you're going to do, but facilitate it and enable it and, and let it happen. As long as it is in line with, it's not too surreal and it's, it's a realistic situation as well. So what I try to think about is how the non-player's characters would react to those situations, like the house being burnt down. Would the farmer get a bucket in order to put it out? Um, how quickly would that fire spread? Um, if Giles starts murdering people and slitting their throats, how would other people <laughs> how would other people react like that? And I think one of those things is fleshing out those characters in a way that would make sense. One of the things that I do is I don't plan the response of every individual character that i think that would be too much what i tend to do is i tend to think this type of person would tend to react like this so i have in my mind a, a, a stereotypical tavern or barkeeper i have in my mind a stereotypical um you know villager etc and i and, and i try to get into those roles as well because by no great shapes am i an actor or an improv um person I think it's just winging it and, and not being afraid if it goes wrong either. I think that's the, the secret to enjoy being a game master or a dungeon master mm. is, is just rolling with it and, and letting it happen. And to your answer of, you know, how do I always have maybe content prepared or, or know what's going to go next or, or always seem to slide into? And that is when you skip content, there's always a way to make sure that it feeds in later. So if you guys skip the, the wild woods that you were going through, then if you guys go off kilter, oh, you found yourself in a wild wild woods and here's this. So some of those some of those um, scenes were already a bit pre-planned because you guys don't know what's going to happen next. You guys don't know what's in my head. So I can always find some way of, of looping in unused content in later. Yeah, well, we're certainly aware of your smiles and your roll dices, and we, we know when something <laughs> bad's coming. Uh, which leads me very nice into the next question of, have you ever been tempted to kill any of us off? I think death should be a real threat um, in the game. I, I think the game loses its integrity if you guys are completely immortal, because then you'd react without the idea of consequences. I think it would be less fun as well, if I'm honest. I, th I think if you guys have a have a taste of that mortality of your characters, it makes the game more meaningful as well. Sometimes you also have to put a party to bed because people get bored of those characters as well. Um, but it is certainly exciting to think that these characters could at any moment end it. And it's creating that fine balance between these guys have gotten into this situation um everything's saying that this party is going to go down the drain i think sometimes you just have to take it there but i try not to put you into too many mean scenarios though i have killed you but well, i've killed giles before haven't i yes <laughs> uh i mean we also have characters like um ad who plays all plays uh i forget what his characters but i do know he's meant to be good and there's mm. been scenarios where he definitely hasn't been good. I don't know if that's Giles will be off on him or if he's just <laughs> like getting too more into the game, showing a little bit bit more of what he wants to do. I think alignment is one of those things that, you know, I, I, I go on things like the Dungeons and Dragons Reddit, for example, and, and you look at what the community of DMs are doing out there. Um Alignment is one of those things that, again, lives in this book and says that, you know, if you're neutral good, you have to act, th act this way. You're lawful good, you have to act in this way. I think new players are never going to get it entirely right. Um, I think also 
for me, alignment isn't necessarily about how you act on a day to day basis. I see it more as um, a potential for what you can do. You think about, um, you know, you think about evil people in real life. You, th you think about, um, you know, for example, you see documentaries of serial killers. They're not killing people at every given moment. Plenty of people have lives beyond that. You know, they go to work, they they make jokes at work, they bring in cakes, they be considerate for other people because, you know, people aren't always actively doing terrible things at every given moment. Some people are very opportunistic. So, uh, you know, I, I see alignment more as a... Um, a limitation on the road that you go down and the actions. I think Ad's character probably isn't good. <laughs> Ad's, Ad's character is, is probably somewhere near neutral, but I think most characters are anyway. I think one of the good things about the way that you guys have played your characters is you've you've all done a bar balance. You know, for example, Giles is a is a, is an evil character, and and take last session for example, the um I think it was session ten of of season yeah, three. Yeah, that's right. Um you were presented with a dilemma of you know there were there were some people being prepared for a sacrifice um in the name of, of your god nex who is a is a homebrew god in our campaign you had to decide didn't you lee between the two the decisions of letting this happen or as these were people from ad's character's hometown all's hometown whether you'd rescue them or not and you came up with a bit of compromise didn't you so you thought you, yes. you have to save face so you sacrificed one and then also because of your personal bonds, you'd save the other character as well. So there isn't the indiscriminate, you know, what I like about the way you guys play your characters is, is there's a bit more of a, a logical perspective of it. But at the same time, you guys are, I say you new characters, we're three seasons in, we're, what, two years into playing Pathfinder? Yes, playing by. It's, 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 it's been a reasonably long time. First campaign for all three of you guys. Um so of course there's going to be moments where you'll you kill the merchant or you'll do this or you do that but you you I think you guys are discovering the way to play your character. So yes, Ad all started out with this lawful good character. Um I think it was lawful good he put down or good neutral whichever whichever one it was but I never anticipated you guys sticking to those parameters and nor would I feel like penalizing you for not either. Um I I think would bad decisions come round and, and bite you? Again, that's where the threat of death and the threat of consequences come in. Um, for example, when your character died, Lee, you guys made a bad decision to invade a dwarven encampment and massacre them all, rather than uh, a diplomatic solution. Correction. And jealous <laughs> made a bad decision. I want to walk away. You'll find that I, I normally want to walk away from these situations. Yeah. And then they be is I'm jealous walks us into them and then they still moan at me today about the five thousand gold that that cost them <laughs> so let's say uh you're watching this and you you've never played dungeons and dragons or pathfinder uh but you're interested in playing it where, where would you start I think there's a there's a few places you could go. I think the first one is picking up the book and, and reading it. There's always some great scenarios, whether you pick up a Pathfinder book, you're playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, whether you're playing something else. I know there's a Star Wars role-playing game that I've played you know, a long time ago out there. Um, there's often some scenarios de depicted in those books um, that are really good places to start. So these, these guides are always, actually, I think they are very well written, in my opinion. Um, the other thing I would say is watch people. I would say there's some shows out there that are very uh, meticulously put together. Um, people are, you know, incredibly prepared for the cameras. I think sometimes that may be a bit intimidating for a new player, but it makes for really good quality entertainment. Um, I think being prepared to for it not to work or, or or to let things play out not like you intended. So what you're saying is if, if you are new and you, you were looking to get into pathfinder you should watch our campaign correct <laughs> why not i mean i by <laughs> no means think we're an entirely a polished product i think we're very oh that's exactly not being a polished product that's where my camera um goes <laughs> ski with um i i think we, it's relatively real you'll see that we don't always go by the rules 100 percent, and sometimes we just make that call how to decide that because i'm not an encyclopedia of the books i, I don't think anyone could ever be 
I, I think fortunately we've got a group that aren't too obsessed with the rules and, and are more interested in the group experience and the storytelling and, and the narrative and ultimately just having fun because that's what it's for. And if, if you're not having fun, there's, there's no point in playing the game. So, so not being too precious as well. I think I'm prepared for any of my non-player characters to die at any time. <laughs> I'm also prepared for my player characters like yourself, Lee, um, Ad and, and Dave to, to die at any time. So yeah, just just have fun and roll with it. I think, like I say, start with start with streaming. There's some great advice out there on YouTube for lots of different channels. I wouldn't um I wouldn't presume to start giving people top ten tips of um, you know, the best things that you could do. I think general advice is just just try it, have fun. Um respect each other as well is a, is a key thing as well so just going slightly off topic do you have your dice that you use uh during yes. your campaigns can you show us them can we, <laughs> can we see what your dice because i know Which lots of people Lee? exactly <laughs> lots of people have special dice i mean i have some uh i'll grab mine in a second and, and show you what i use but, <laughs> but i'm intrigued to see what you have i'm well, sure the viewers will like to see what you've got for some reason over the years i've started to collect dice and for some reason since we've been doing pathfinder norvald i've discovered lots and lots of different websites that do all sorts of different dice um i have some favorites um and i'll just very quickly show you um the ones i'm playing with at the moment uh, but i tend to get a bit bored so i've got these ones that look like tiny landmines i don't know if you can see them very well yeah um i've got lots of different um so i've told them to stay you know the second. standard set oh sorry yeah just there we go. It does focus very there nice. So I've got my tiny spiky landmine set, and that's the that's the uh, set of dice I've been using currently. One of my favourites, strangely, strangely enough, was a more simple set. I've I've got you know metal hollow dice. I've got all sorts of metal dice because um, I like metal dice, but in particular some of my favourites. Nope, not that one. I've got my dice trays. Yeah, I'm one of these people. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, see, that's what I want me. to that's see. The wrong, Let's have a bit a bit of a best tray. look at that one more. One more time. Let's, we'll have to look at this one one more time. Yeah, let, let's see what you've got in there. That that's a lovely a lovely set. <laughs> so that's the wrong tray. Let's grab the other tray. So this is my next tray, and this has one of my favourite sets in. So strangely enough the ones that are my favorite are the ones that i bought just when we started the campaign and that's these ones and they have these tiny little weapons on oh very nice and they're blue as well and it just reminds me of you know the the ice and snow of norveld so yeah i would i would have to say that they're my faves but i suppose it's uh not necessarily particularly interesting what listening me half on about dice for uh, several hours let's have a look at yours Lee. yeah they come in they're on the way well first of all I, I keep everything in this lovely dice tray um because i don't have anything else to put them in my favorite set is actually the first set i bought they're, they're not special um uh, how well we can see this about more for and out but they're, they're solid metal dice and um they roll really well i find a lot of times with certain dice, they can be poorly weighted if they're cheap. So I've always gone now with expensive dice. My favourite set um, are these. I, d I can't remember what, what these are made out of. But are they? They're your hollow metal dice, aren't they? They are, they're yeah. They are, they are hollow. They're yeah. very shiny. But as you can see, even just looking at that's in focus, you can't see the numbers. The numbers are tiny. So <laughs> when you're trying to play a game with these dice, you know you're there squinting away trying to figure out what the numbers are and it's these aren't as bad uh this was a special set that uh see if it gets into focus that i bought this was like a mystery set and these are sort of gold uh and then the green with cocks around the numbers and they've got like a a yellow and green glitter difficult to focus i'll try and show you one more time my camera bad, wants to focus bad. on my face i'll have to hide <laughs> there we go look so yeah they they're nice and i just have the three sets i had to stop at three sets um so going back to something you said just before that actually um was the norvald campaign and our, our adventure and i just want to know how he came up with the concept of um 
our world, really. I've been creating homebrew or, or original content for quite a while. In fact, I've never made played a pre-made mod, pre-made module. I know there's some incredibly popular fifth edition ones, things like Curse of Strahd, Rime of the Frost Maiden, etc. There's there's some really good written pre pre-made modules out there. I've never used one strangely enough um and we always created our own world so it was more out of habit I, I ended up finding that i had so much content that i thought i might as well just plonk it all into one world um to make it easy enough so whenever you hear about anything else going on in the background they're kind of things that have either happened in in other campaigns or areas in the world um I think world building, I wouldn't re recommend trying it all in one go. Um, I certainly didn't start with a map. I started with um, fleshing out certain areas, thinking about how the different races, how the different species act with each other, um, thinking about religion and gods and how all that works and just generally following it through. Um, even if you just make a few villages or towns and starting with there and populating it, you've already started to make your own homebrew content of putting a world together as for norvald and and the creation of this campaign one of the things that i've always been very interested in is the the archetypal hero's journey and i think it's one of the allures of, of things like dnd &D and, and pathfinder what how do you take a, a bunch of characters or, or or people and you send them onto a journey in the world and season one very much centers around um a job that that becomes a little bit bigger than they that, than they thought it would be, and and you guys end up escorting the local village chieftain um, to a, a a place in which you can essentially vote for the next king of the land. Um, it takes a few twists and turns, and seasons two starts with not too many spoilers. That doesn't necessarily go to plan, so that vote happens, but everything else goes wrong, and the next set of the journey starts again. So. Um, I've tried to make each season have a little bit of a different flavor. So the first one being the journey, the second being more of a um, defensive exploratory element of um, assisting a, a, a village or a town out. And the third season has been very much uh, working in a, a, a city that's under siege. So yeah. there's been, uh, you know, trying to create different themes for each season to keep it to keep it fresh, in my opinion. I mean, we as a player, I I don't know what's going to happen on any episode. House doesn't tell us anything. So what you see, what you hear from uh, Paris on stream is exactly when we're hearing it too. So when we stumble for a split second and go quiet, it's because we're having to think what we're going to do in that moment. So yeah, I mean, it makes, you know, that this is why it's so difficult for Paris to predict what we're going to do because we don't even know what we're going to do. Mm. But yeah. Well, thank you uh, for your time today, Paris. Um, that's a nice insight. Um, we'll definitely be making a few more videos on the background of um, Norvold. Uh, and yeah, if you've uh, enjoyed this video, yeah, video please uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, like. Thank you very much.